right. So to start off, I mean, well, a couple things to start off. I'll remind you that the second midterm exam is a week from Friday, a week from uh, the next class. Same idea as last midterm, 30 questions, multiple choice. It will cover material primarily since the, the first midterm. So my, my concept with the, with the two midterms and the final is that there's a, the first midterm covers the first third of the course. The second midterm mostly covers the second third of the course. The final has two halves, in effect. One half is the third midterm, 30 questions. And the other 30 questions, uh, it being double length compared to the midterms, covers the whole course. Okay, So it's cumulative over the whole course. So, any questions about midterm stuff? Um, you know, where will we end? We'll get in pretty well into radio um, and hopefully through microwave ovens also, which are very closely related to, to radio. Uh, it's possible we'll get started in light, but which is also very closely related to radio, but we'll see. Okay? Um, in talking to people about the problem set that, we, that was just due, um, at the start of class, I've let, nah, Friday, it, it's not due at the, oh man, yay, that, yeah, I, so I can talk about things that I've forgotten to talk about. Um, do I have the important one here? Yeah, I do. Okay, so good. Yeah, the problem set that wasn't due just now, who fooled myself. Okay, so I've got a bunch of things to, to, to go back, so this is, this is a little bit of, uh, stepping backwards, but finally this class is our class. We can you know, it's, cover stuff that's useful to you all, and hopefully some of these things will actually be, be useful topics, things that, that you might remember and find important. I mean, the first one is the issue of, of magnetic materials in general and soft magnetic materials versus hard magnetic materials. A magnetic material is one that has some magnetic structure intrinsically in it. Um, I mean, the, the, there are experts in the field of, of magnetic materials that may quibble with me, some of the things I'm, I'm going to say, but the, but the basic idea is this. There are materials that are simply non-magnetic. A chunk of wood, uh, uh, a stain, the, a certain kinds of stainless steel, aluminum, copper, brass, um, window glass. These are non-magnetic materials. It's extremely hard to get any magnetic response out of them at all. You can, and the experts can do that. But, but not for the same reason. There, so if you zoom in at the microscopic level, uh, so you're looking down in sort of at the level of atoms, looking around, there's just no magnetism around. It's all canceled. Any atomic magnetism that was there is just gone because wherever there was an electron with its, mag with its north pole up, there's also an electron with its north pole down. And they sum to zero, nothing. Okay. So those, those materials are, are boring magnetically. But there are materials that are interesting magnetically, and the classic one is, is iron. If you zoom in at iron at the microscopic level, you'll discover, wow, there's a lot of uncanceled atomic magnetism left. It's there because the electrons are not all head to toe. Uh, there are unpaired electrons that are, that are pointing the same direction, and you can, they're, they, they're therefore locally magnetically uh, intense. In fact, a, on a small patch of iron, it's, it's always magnetic. Every little tiny patch of iron is magnetic. The issue is when you zoom out a bit, you discover that there, this magnetic character breaks up into, into domains, little regions, where all the local atomic magnets line up. But if you go from one domain to the adjacent domain, they'll disagree about which way to have their north poles. And there's good reason for this. If if all the domains have their north poles up, suppose that's the case. So, so they're all separate domains. Each one's fully magnetic. Let's suppose for the moment that they're all north pole up, south pole down. One of the domains in the middle of this discovers, wow, my north pole is up. And, oh no, for, I should first say, all those no, north poles, with their uh, domains with their north poles up, gradually that effect accumulates until the entire material has the, effectively a giant magnetic uh, north pole on the top and a giant magnetic south pole on the bottom. It's just sort of the sum of all these little teeny bar magnets, all north pole up, 
If you sum them all together, it's as though there's one giant north at the top and one giant south at the bottom. Does that seem relatively intuitive? When you do that, you look at one of these guys in the middle and it goes, wow, my north pole's up close to that giant cumulative north pole. I don't like that. I would rather turn my north pole down so that it's closer to the cumulative south pole because opposites attract. So each little domain goes, wait a second, this is a mistake. I'm pointing, you know, I, I'm herd mentality here, I'm out pointing up, I should turn over, that will release energy. Um, and things try to reduce their total potential energy after, after all. So the domains tend to flip over. So what happens is the, the piece of iron, given the opportunity, all the domains begin to flip trying to get their energy as low as possible, their potential energy as low as possible. And those giant poles that I just described disappear. They, there's just widespread disagreement about which way to point. The result is no magnetism. So that's, that's iron right after it's cast at the foundry in the absence of any influence uh, on it. It's okay? It appears non-magnetic. But that's not because it's not intrinsic. It doesn't have microscopic magnetism. It's just masked by this widespread cancellation. Now, iron, pure iron, well, you can easily get those, those domains to orient if you expose them to an external field that, 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 that's uh, an external field that refuses to, to, to change. It's just, it's just imposed on, on, the, on the iron. If you bring, for example, a south pole a North Pole up to the bottom of my, my this, this chunk of iron that I'm pretending is in front of me, you bring a North Pole up to the bottom, it will align all the domains. They'll turn South Pole down because the North Pole that's coming up at them gets their attention. And now this whole structure will develop, oh, a giant North Pole at the top and a giant South Pole at the bottom because all the domains will agree. Once you take away that magnetic, external magnetic influence, then they go back to fighting with each other again. They start flipping over, trying to get rid of this, you know, each one trying to reduce its potential energy. And so you get this widespread disagreement that the magnetism vanishes. And that is, that is the, the effect I showed here, that these, these, these paper clips do not stick to each other at present. But if I bring a strong magnet up to them, ah, I'm collecting all the, all the paper clips. When I bring a strong, the, the north, this is a red's a North Pole. I bring the North Pole up to the bottom of this guy. The South Pole develops at the bottom of the piece of, of piece. It, it's steel. It's not quite iron, but it's very close. I mean, I, I, steel is, is 90, this one's probably 99% uh, iron. There's now a North Pole at its tip. And if I bring a, another paper clip up to it, that, that other paper clip will stick, and so on. They're each, one, each one's magnetizing the next one. But once I take away the magnet, they're sticking, they're sticking now, and I've, I've been playing with this before class, they're sticking now because they sort of got used to each other, but, but, but once you take them apart, they don't stick, eh, just barely, okay? It, just, it, hasn't quite, it can't pick up the next one. There's a little magnetism left here, okay? But, but not much. Um, so They're all jumping all over this. So iron, pure iron is a very soft magnetic material. It's easy to magnetize because there's nothing obstructing the, the flipping of domains. Easy to get them all to line up, and then it easily forgets the alignment uh, and, and, and goes back. So that's a soft magnetic material. First of all, it's a magnetic material, meaning that it's got that microscopic um, magnetic structure. It's soft, meaning that it very easily changes that magnetic structure. Uh, rearranges that magnetic structure, so it easily develops a magnetization and easily loses it. Okay? Where do you want materials like that? Well, for example, in transformers, where you want to be able to magnetize it and demagnetize it, magnetize it, demagnetize it, flip it upside down, back and forth and back and forth. You don't want it to have any opinion about which way it should be magnetized. Just, just have it forget very quickly. Uh, another case would be a, an electromagnet where you're, you, you work in a, in a car junkyard. You know how they pick cars up with electromagnets? You may have, if you haven't seen it live, you may have seen it in pictures. They'll, they'll go get a, a, a car, drop an electromagnet on it, turn on the electromagnet, which makes it magnetic now, 
and it developed the, the car develops opposite poles and gets attracted strongly to the electromagnet. They can pick it up, and when they want to drop it, they just turn off the electromagnet, and everything forgets its magnetization. The forces vanish, car drops. So that's you want a soft magnetic material. What's the alternative? The alternative is hard magnetic materials. I mean, obviously everything in between, but hard magnetic materials are different ones that are structurally difficult to magnetize and difficult to unmagnetize. The domains don't move around easily. They don't change shape and size because of t typically stru physical structure in the, in the material. Um, some of these magnets are, are, have, have tremendous internal structure. Uh, crystal, they're, they're crystals, they're complicated crystals, they're, they're fiber-like crystals, all sorts of stuff. And they make it hard for the domains to change shape and size. And the result is you get a material that just is very hard to get those domains to, to line up or to, 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 to change their orientations. And it's very hard for them to then consequently return to where they started. So when you make a, a hard magnetic material, for, uh, initially it's non-magnetic. You, know, you just assembled it. You have to actively magnetize it. Once you do that, you, you take all the little magnetic domains that were disagreeing with one another, you force them really against their will. They hate this. They really fight it hard. You force them to line up with each other so that you develop, they're all, say, pointing North Pole up. You develop the giant North Pole at the top, the giant South Pole at the bottom overall. And, and it gets stuck. It can't undo this. The little domains in the middle go, whoa, I'm turned, I'm turned so that my North Pole is really close to this giant North Pole. I could do better if I flipped upside down, but I can't flip. I'm stuck, structurally stuck because of the, the, the nature of the material itself. And so now you've got a permanent magnet. It can't forget. It's really hard for it to forget. Things that, that, that uh, anything that really jiggles the material uh, encourages it to forget. For example, uh, hitting, the, hitting it with a, with a mallet, you can, you can injure a, a magnet by, by smacking it. It's not good for a, for a, for a good magnet. Like, like one of these guys, if you took a hammer and kept hitting it, you could, you could easily reduce it. You would certainly reduce its magnetization. Whether you would wipe it out, I don't know. But it's not good for it. Um, heat is typically bad for it, because heat is little microscopic jiggling. And most magnets, my magnet, I would say all permanent magnets, have a temperature above which they lose their magnetism. Uh, they just, the, the, the domains begin to flip over, and it's gone. And different magnets have different temperatures. These magnets, these, all, these, these were all the rage like 15 years ago. They're, it's before your time. They're, they're, they're super magnets in glass. And so when you, when you bring them together, they, 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 they want to stick, but they bounce off each other, and they make the, that great sound. You can hear it, I hope. Right? So these, the glass melts at a temperature much too hot for the magnet to stay magnetized. So to make these guys, they must have encapsulated unmagnetized supermagnets inside glass. And then when the glass was cold and everything was ready to ship, then they magnetized them by exposing them to a really strong magnetic field that moved all the domains around and got the North Pole to appear at one end and the South at the other. Is that OK? Um, yeah. No. When you magnetize it, is it arbitrary which side becomes north and which becomes south? When you clearly choose it by where you, where, what, what, in effect, what north pole, you, where, where you bring the north pole. Whatever place you bring the north pole effectively, it'll develop a south pole. Not all magnet, some of the best permanent magnets have an internal structural orientation so that you don't actually have complete freedom over which way you're going to magnetize it. It's, it's got an opinion already. You can make it, you can take the thing and you can magnetize it north pole up, or North Pole down, but it's not as good if you try to make it North Pole to the, to the left versus to the right. It, it, it wants an up-down polarization, um, magnetization. And actually, this is relevant to, to your, your hard drives. Most of you on your computers, you still have hard drives, although so solid-state drives are starting to take over, too. What is a hard drive? A hard drive is these spinning platters. They're, that's their name. Just, I, they're called platters. They're, they're, it's a, it's a, they're, they're metal disks, typically, I guess, aluminum that are coated with a very thin layer of a very hard magnetic material. Why does that have to be very hard? Because they're going to use the most exquisitely small portion of it to remember each bit of information. Tiny little portion, and the portion next to it 
to that, that tiny, so, so there's, there's a, each bit in your computer recorded on your hard drive corresponds to a tiny little patch on this coding. Th that patch is unbelievably small now. I, I, I'm not even sure what the, di what the, the diameter is, but, it, but, it, but it's measured in, in, in billionths of a meter side to side, just exquisitely small. And the way I think they're currently written is they are uh, either north pole up or they're, or they're south pole up. It's a, it's a the magnetization, if this is the platter, th I think they're now working with vertical uh, magnetization. So it's north pole up, sticking out at the top of the coating, or, or north pole down at the bottom of the coating. And the coating is like exquisitely thin too. All this stuff is incredible tour de force that they do this and they sell it to you for such little money. It's just astonishing. But anyway, if this guy's north pole up, the adjacent bit, which is only you know, some number of billionths of a meter away, might easily be the opposite or might be the same. And they might fight each other. They've got to be very adamant at keeping their magnetization. So they're, they're, they use very hard magnetic materials so that they, that they uh, retain their, their bit. In fact, they're, 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 they're limited finally with, with this writing process by, by just thermal agitation. If, the bits, if they make bits physically too small, they involve too, many, too few atoms, then they, thermal energy is strong enough to, make it, to, to erase it. Just the, just, the, just the room temperature jiggling of stuff can, can wipe out the bits. Um, and they're pushing that limit. It's a, yeah, actually, these bits are smaller than a, than a single domain. They are a single domain. So there's, no, there's none of this fighting between adjacent domains in, within a single bit. It's, it, it's just one domain. You either have it magnetized north pole up or north pole down. That's all you got, the only two choices. Is that OK? Uh, it used to be that magnetic tapes were important, and the same story is true, true there, uh, it, it, much less sophisticated magnetization, but uh, tapes have gone the way of the dodo bird. About the only tape that you're, that you're used to these days are the, are the magnetic strips on your, card, on your cards. And this is a, yeah, this is a question on the, it's a question on the problem set, but, but um, your cards, Pur the purpose is try and record information so, and, and keep that information. So do you want it to be forgetful like soft iron, or do you want it to be really good at remembering like a piece of, of permanent magnet? So it should be pretty easy. Um, hotel cards, as someone reminded me this morning, uh, credit cards are pretty good at keeping, their, keeping their, uh, their memory. They don't get wiped out easily. Hotel room cards, which is sort of a technology that's fading now that chip stuff is, is, is appearing. Those cards got wiped out pretty easily, and people talk about having it near your cell phone, wiping it out. I mean, I think the problem there is, first, first off, they have to be made super cheap, so that they just use, they use crummy materials. And second off, because they keep, write, they keep changing the information every day, they keep reusing the card, write it again, write it again, write it again, um, they're, they're just not very good at retaining their memory. And so they're not. Among other things, they're not very hard magnetic materials, inadequately hard, and they get wiped out easily. Is that OK? Um, relating to that, um, just to show you, do I have to go and do it like this? Not yet. Um, what I wanted to show you was you know, refrigerator magnets. So, so, so you, these guys, they are made. The, the material that goes into them is it's obviously not, not simple iron because it's flexible. They are made, of course, non-magnetic when, when, when they're first fabricated. They are deliberately magnetized uh, as a piece of an anecdote about this is there are people who, who put essentially refrigerator magnets in like their shoes or in gloves, feeling like magnetism is, 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 is curative, helps helps heal wounds and stuff, or you know, ma makes you feel better, right? So, so you can buy magnets that will cure all ails, because magnetism is so mysterious. And it is pot well, people have done studies. I haven't looked into this for years. But people have done studies where they took the magnets, and they didn't magnetize them. They look the same as the magnetized ones. It's just they haven't been magnetized, or, or I'll show you in a minute, demagnetized. And 
the result, so you can put them in. Oh, magnet. Ooh, put it in my shoe. Oh, my, it feels so good. And apparently, there, no, one, no one was able to tell whether they had a magnetized or demagnetized one. In fact, basically, the, that the way the study was structured, I think everybody was, did, thought they were magnetized, and they were, everybody thought that they were feeling better. So that tells you about the effects of magnetism on people. We're basically non-magnetic. We don't notice magnetism, except in extremely special cases. OK? All right, I wanted, to I wanted to show you the, the magnetization on these guys. It's not the obvious magnetization. It's not like there's a North Pole at one end and South Pole at the other. And the way to see the poles is, how am I going to do this? Like this. If I use the whole hour on this, who cares? You don't care. Um, document camera. We're going to be looking down from this camera on that screen. Da, 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 da. I hope. Yes. My wife looks after me. <laughs> so. Oh, wanted that, that was stupid. I want I I to keep the magnet in place. And I'm trying not to put the iron powder on the magnet itself. Can you see it's striped? The, mag, the, the powder is getting drawn into the, to the strongest part of the magnetic field. That's what, that's what iron does. If you, if, you, if you expose it to put it in, the, in a magnetic field, first off, it magnetizes. And second off, so, I mean, so this is another thing to, to, to walk through. If you have, I, I think I did this on Monday, if you have a chunk of iron and you put it in a uniform magnetic field, which is the Earth's magnetic field, for example, which is uniform north pole that way, because that's north. Every piece of iron that you put in there First off, it develops a south pole, no, a, nor a north pole, a north pole at the downfield end, the end in the direction of the field, because that north, the magnetic fields push north poles. So the more north pole gets pushed that direction and develops at that end of the, of the piece of iron. So the little iron piece has a north pole there, and the south pole gets pushed up, up field, the opposite of the arrows. It appears over here. So there's a North Pole here, South Pole there on every piece of iron that's in, in the Earth's magnetic field. Does that make sense? The North Pole continues to be pushed in the direction of the field, namely to the north. The South Pole continues to be pushed opposite the direction of the field, namely south. And because the field is uniform and these two poles are equal but opposite, there's no net force on the piece of iron. It's, it's pushed northward just as hard as it's pushed southward, nothing. Okay. But suppose you have a, a magnetic field that gets stronger as you go northward. For example, it originates in the south pole of a magnet right there. Now, when you put the iron piece in here, it develops a north pole at this end, south pole at that end. But because the field's getting stronger as you go that way, this north pole is pushed forward harder than the south pole is pushed backward. And it wins. The north pole wins. It, it, it gets pushed more. And it sucks the whole piece of iron towards the pole. Towards the, towards the increasing field. And so that's what you're seeing here. On, on this screen, you're seeing the iron is getting sucked into the strongest parts of the magnetic field, namely the, the region between north and south poles. That's where, that's where it ends up. That's where the field is strongest. So this thing's magnetized. It has a whole horizontal row of north pole, then a whole horizontal row of south pole, then a whole horizontal row of north pole, you know, and back and forth and back and forth. Is that OK? And when you put it against your refrigerator, it develops, the refrigerator responds by developing opposite poles as close as it can to, the, to, the, to these poles, and they, they grab onto each other. Um, the other thing to show you, now like, I, mean, I just wanted to keep the magnets clean, because the iron powder, you can't get it off the magnets very well. These guys, because of that, that, that row shape, the, remember they're rows along like this? They're rows on this one as well. And if I pull these guys apart across each other, they, vi they vibrate. OK? I, I, mean, I don't know if you can see it. I can, you, you can hear it. So if you've got a couple of these things kicking around, and that ideally you get ones that are identical, because they're, they're magnetized the same way. They, they've done, done it at the same time. S find an you'll find an orientation. They'll stick to each other. And at a certain orientation where you've got the rows parallel to each other and you slide it across those rows, you'll feel it 
alternately grab and then repel. Grab and repel, grab and repel, grab and repel. Okay? So this is kind of like, basically, a, the magnetic strip on your credit card is exactly the same, maybe even made of the same material. The difference is, instead of having uniform rows on it, it's got a st structure to those rows that, that has all the coded information about you and finances. Okay? So, that one, okay. So that's one of my stories here. <laughs> we burn a lot of time. Magnetizing and demagnetizing. I showed you, to, to magnetize something, we, we, you saw with the paper clips that, that bringing this iron near, near the magnetic pole magnetizes the paper clip, which can then magnetize a second paper clip, and they may or may not forget easily. Um, they're, they're, they're having trouble forgetting. Um, they are not reliably, their memory is, is, is so flaky that I can't work with them to, to show you what I want to show you. Don't go jumping at each other, guys. All right. Um, I'm going to work with a, with, a, with a steel bolt. So a steel bolt, it's got a little more, more carbon in it than the paper clips. It it's depends on what, what steel you're using, but, but it's got a better memory. This, this does not magnetize and demagnetize quite as easily. It's not suitable for a real permanent magnet, but you can magnetize it decently. And the way I'm going to magnetize it is with the strongest magnet in the room, which isn't a permanent magnet. The permanent magnets suffer from the problem that even the hardest magnetic materials, if you look inside and, and look at the individual domains, they are being, uh, magnetic forces on them are so tremendous if, in, a, in a highly magnetized magnet that the individual domains want to turn over and get their north poles away from the cumulative north pole and get their south poles away from the cumulative south pole. Some of them flip over. I mean, you just lose them. You just lose some. So, so magnet, permanent magnets tend to demagnetize themselves. They tend to, to flip their domains over and, and lose some of their magnetism. If you impose their magnetization externally, say with a current of, of uh, electric current in a wire, you can get all the, the domains to line up, and you just can force them to line up. You know, forget it. You can't turn over. So this guy magnetizes the iron about as strongly as iron can be magnetized. Basically, all the domains line up. They're just seriously uh, aligned. And, and it turns out it's really hard to get this bolt off, off that magnet. I don't know whether it's North Pole or South Pole. I, you know, we could figure it out, but who cares? So, so this guy is, this was seriously magnetizing this, this bolt and then sticking to each other. I'll come back to the spark. So this, this was magnetized while it was on the electromagnet. It turns out it's still magnetized. Right? It picks up, picks up paper clips pretty nicely. And it will stay magnetized for a long time. And there are lots of tools, for, for particularly screwdrivers, uh, you can magnetize them, and that's often convenient if you're trying to put a, install a screw into a little hole through something, and you can't, you know, how you can hold the screw there while you get the screwdriver going? Yeah, magnetize the screwdriver. If it's a steel screw, it sticks to the screwdriver, you can stick it through the hole and get it, put it in place. Life is good, okay? Um, there, there's, there's some hammers, like tack hammers, that you magnetize the tip of the hammer, you put the tack, stick the tack onto the hammer, it's just sitting there, thunk, you punch it into the wood. Okay, so this guy's magnetized. How do you demagnetize it? It's it's got a, a some decent amount of, of memory. It it wants to stay. You can smack it with a hammer a whole bunch of times and, and damage its magnetization, which makes you think tack hammers probably have to keep remagnetizing because they probably keep getting injured by the impact. You could heat it. If you heat it red hot, it'll lose its magnetism. But the other way you can do it is deliberately magnetize it. Again, but instead of with a consistent North Pole, always in the same location, try magnetizing it first one way and then the other and back and forth. And that's what this device is. This is a, this is a demagnetizer. It uses a coil of wire to create an electromagnet with the core being the bolt, but it's using an alternating current. It connects right into the power line. And so the current goes first one way, then the other, which means the, magnet the magnetization that's going to be imposed on this bolt points first one way and then the other and then back and forth. And if I gradually pull the bolt out, 
it's going to be it's going to have its memory wiped okay so this is the ne nebulizer what was it you know for wiping out its memory here men in black that's that's before your time too it's pretty sad okay so i'm going to i'm going to start the current going and now as i bring the i bring the bolt in it's it's buzzing <laughs> Because the forces on this are vibrating as the, as the current goes back and forth and back and forth. The forces, and as I pull it out slowly, it, it should now be demagnetized. Nothing. So if you find something in your household that, is, that becomes magnetized and it's a nuisance, you can get one of these guys and wipe the magnetism out. Uh, my, my favorite story on this, of course, because you have to get my favorite story. Television sets of the old days, before, before the flat panels, remember the, the big CR, CRTs, the big cathode ray tube television sets of, of, of back uh, in the dinosaur era? We had one of those. Um, when I was a kid, ours was a, our initial set was a black and white television set. I mean, you're just totally not used to any of this stuff. It was black and white. Okay, that was great. You know, I, I didn't mind. But, it, but uh, we got a color television set. Woohoo! And it arrived. And before the color television set showed up, I used to play with my magnet, which I had a really strong magnet. For that era, it was a horseshoe magnet, North Pole and the South Pole on a, on a horseshoe. And the physics of how these cathode ray tubes worked was a fascinating physics that's, that's sort of now history. The, it would shoot electrons, those negatively charged beasties that we've talked about before, it would shoot them through empty space from the back of the tube to the front of the tube where they would hit very hard. And they would hit what are known as phosphors, materials that when you give them energy, they glow. They, they emit light. They turn that energy into light energy. And in a black and white television set, they just make white light. That was, that was the only reason. And the television set guides the electrons back and forth electromagnetically using electric fields. Well. If you hold a magnet in the vicinity of this beam of electrons, electrons which are moving, moving electrons have, are a current. There's some, some, uh, there's some magnetism there. And the magnet, the two of them talk to each other. And basically, the electrons are deflected. The actual effect is known as the Lorentz force. It's a, it's just, I think we'll come to it. But it's not a big deal. The, the main thing is that you can imagine moving charges and magnets, they talk. And so I could deflect the beam. And what that would do is, and my favorite thing was with baseball games, there's, there, there was a classic shot that I don't know if they do with this anymore, from above, of watching the pitcher at the top of the screen throw the ball to the batter at the bottom of the screen. Is this, is this, do they do this at all anymore? It was, it was standard. And with my magnet in place, the ball would go whew, and I, I could make real curveballs. It would just deflect the whole screen. All right. So when the, when the Color television set came. Color television sets had three colors of phosphor, that was, we'll talk about with light. Red, green, and uh, blue. And that's how they made, made us see all colors. In order to control the, the, the colors perfectly with the, the dots of phosphor on the screen, they had a, an insert known as a shadow mask that had little holes in it. You don't see the shadow mask, but it casts a shadow. If, if the electrons are coming from this direction and go through the holes, they illuminate only red phosphor. If they come from this direction, they illuminate only blue. If they come from this direction, they go through the hole and, and, and illuminate only green. And so it, they, they controlled color by where the electrons came from, and they used three different sources to give the three colors. Well, because that shadow mask has to maintain perfect registration with the dot pattern on the, on the glass screen, it was made of a special metal that doesn't change its shape at all, expand or contract with temperature, as good as they could get it. And it's a steel alloy. And it's magnetizable. And so I did the trick of watching the, the ball go crazy cockeyed on baseball with my magnet. And it did. And not only did it do that, did it go crazy, but the colors were crazy too, because now I was really changing the way the electrons were flying through this tube. The problem was when I took away the magnet, I had magnetized the shadow mask. 
it, not only is it magnetic metal, it's a magnetizable metal that stays, it's a permanent, it's a hard, it's a hard magnetic material, and I had magnetized it. The colors remain googly googly, uh, despite my magnet not being anywhere near them. And for some reason, I was the only one home when the repair person came to fix the television set, uh, under warranty, of course, because it was like a minute old. Um, and he asked me whether, hmm, has anybody started a vacuum cleaner nearby? Because just the act of starting an electromagnetic device like a vacuum cleaner could conceivably have done this, although I, I, he must have been going like, I've never seen it this bad before. I'm gonna say, and by, of course, I said, probably. I don't know what happened. Um, and he used one of these, essentially, a, a big one, to demagnetize it. He just, he'll hold this in front of the screen, and all the colors are great. Ooh, this is so exciting. And as he backs away, gets farther and farther, it just scrambles all the domains. Magnetize them one way or the other, back and forth, and then less and less and less until they're gone. And it was perfect, you know, no, no problem after all. But hmm. needless to say, I did not try that ever again. All right? There's a fair amount of physics in that story. So. All right, more of my, more things. Ah, three. Back to this guy, the spark. Right now, this is non-magnetic. There's no magnetic field here. When I close that switch, the magnetic field builds up. It doesn't go on instantly. Why? Because magnetic fields actually have energy in them. Uh, corresponding electric fields do as well. Um, and that's going to be important when I talk about radio waves, electromagnetic waves, because electromagnetic waves carry energy. Uh, you know that because we have solar power after all, right? The sun's light, which is an electromagnetic wave, carries energy to the Earth. What's got the energy en route? Well, it's the electric and magnetic fields. They're carrying the energy. So when I turn on this electromagnet, the electric power is actually going to go into the magnet during the first portion of a second or two while the magnetic field builds up. So here we go. I better hold this out of here. OK, there was mm, energy went in. There's now a big magnetic field around here. How do you know that? Because of that. That magnetic field has lots of energy in it. It's not, a, the magnetic field is constant at this point. So the uh, power system is no longer feeding the, the magnetic field. In principle, you don't need any additional energy to keep this going. In practice, you do because one of the problems on the, on the homework assignment. So no longer is any energy going to the magnetic field. It's there. Everything's good. We're done. When I break the connection and the magnetic field begins to go away, it doesn't go away all at once either because it's got energy in it. The energy's got to go somewhere. Where's the energy going to go? Well, the energy is going to go into that spark. That spark was, was the energy coming back out. And you might think, OK, so, so how, how does it suck energy out of the power system on the, when you turn the magnet on? And how does it give energy back to the power system when you turn the, the, the uh, magnet off? Well, if you think about when you turn the magnet on and the magnetic field is increasing, it's a changing magnetic field. Changing magnetic fields are electric. They create electric, they create electric fields. And the electric field that is created fights the increasing magnetism. Remember Lenz's law? Magnetic, if you induce a magnetic effect, it fights the change that induced it. So when you try to increase the field here, the, the result is a fighting of the increased magnetic field. It tries to stop the current from increasing by pushing it backwards. No, no, no. Okay. So during the startup process, the, the, the current is pushed backwards, energy is sucked out of it by doing negative work on it, and that energy ends up in the field. When you open the circuit and the magnetic field begins to decrease, I, mean, I should say in between, now that the magnetic field is constant, it's boring, there's no electric field left. Nothing special is happening to the current. The current would flow for free if the wires were perfect, but they're not. OK, when I try to turn off the current, the magnetic field will begin to decrease. Ah, it's a changing magnetic field again. And changing magnetic fields create electric fields. In this case, those electric fields 
don't fight the current. They, they try to keep the current going. No, 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 don't go away. So they push the current forward. And they'll push the current forward so hard, they will try to keep it going even though there's now an air gap between the, the, in the switch. They're, that spark occurs because the, the charges are being pushed forward so, so vigorously by the, by the decreasing magnetic field that they jump right through empty space to try to keep the current flowing. There's actually a huge voltage rise. Voltage drop appears across the switch. This concept of a, of a device that fights changes in current. It hates having the current turned on, because, and, it, and it does that by soaking up energy in the, from the current to make its magnetic field. It fights the turning off the current by trying to keep the go current going, by using its magnetic field to, to energy to push the current forward. Don't stop. So it fights every change you, you can imagine in the current. Don't increase, don't decrease. We'll fight you. It's called an inductor, and it's part of the story with radio. So an electromagnet is also a, a device known as an inductor. And at this point, I've told you the three most important classic electronic, electric components, electronic components. I mean, short of the transistor, that's another story which we'll come to. A resistor is a device that obeys Ohm's law, that basically carries current in proportion to the voltage drop across it. So there are... I'll, one of these days, I'll remember to bring up a, a, a just an elect, random electronic device. You rip open a random electronic device. I don't think they'd like me to tear apart one of these ones. <laughs> rip it open, you'll discover devices that are, their only reason to be is they're resistors. They are just ohmic devices. The current they carry is proportional to the voltage drop across them. It's useful. Second device is called a capacitor, we've seen. This is a device that has two surfaces and stores separated charge, positive on one, negative on the other. And it has a voltage drop that's related to how much uh, charge it has on its surfaces. Again, those are really useful in electronics all over the place. Inductor is the third device. It's, it's one of these electromagnetic devices. Uh, it, it, it fights changes in current. If you try to s increase or decrease the current, it will develop a, 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 a different, it will respond by developing a voltage difference between its ends. It tries to fight the change in current. All right? OK. Next thing. I'm going to spend my whole time on this, which is OK. Uh, coil of wire that has, that has, that has uh, current flowing through it. If you just back away from a coil and just have a, just a single wire, and let's just send current through a single wire from left to right. When the current is flowing through that wire, Currents are magnetic. There's a magnetic field around the wire. What does it look like? It turns out it's loops. The magnetic field, if, I, if, if it's arrows, it's an arrow, it's an arrow, it's an arrow. It circles. It circles around the wire. And it circles in a cer certain direction. And I think the handedness is it follows the right-hand rule where your thumb is the current and the, the, the field then curves with your fingers. I think that's right. I always have to look it up. But anyway, so there are loops of, of magnetic field going around this wire. If you take the wire, so you, you would discover this by, by holding a compass near that, that current carrying wire, and you would discover it lines up, it, it'll line up in, a, in loop wise, sort of along these loops, it'll line up uh, one way, pointing at right angles to the, to, the, to the wire. And if you move the compass around, you'll discover, wow, there's a whole loop structure to it. When you take that wire and wind it up into a coil and run current through it, those individual, the, 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 the field circling, each portion of wire, they add up cumulatively, depending on where you are relative to that coil of wire. And it turns out when you're, when you're in the center of the coil, the current, suppose I'm in the center of the coil and the current's going around me. That loop structure means the current, if, if the current's going around me this direction, which I call upward, you know, like that, the loop structure of, of the magnetic field always points down on the outside, up in the middle, up where I am. It's up where I am. It's up where I All the pieces of magnetic field from all the little pieces of, of current add up together to point upward. The field's strong. And at the center of the coil, you might imagine it's especially strong. OK? Uh, OK. 
So the field in a coil of wire like this, it's strongest right there. And if you take a piece of metal, uh, iron, and the you allow the field to magnetize it, it magnetizes, and then it, as I've talked earl earlier, a, a magnet first points in the direction of the field, and then it seeks strongest field. So watch what happens when I turn this guy on. Is it still plugged in here? It's pulled in, right? And I can do it with paper, but same idea. That effect, where when you have a current carrying coil and you have iron around it, and the iron gets sucked into the middle, is used in zillions of gadgets. Um, it is the classic doorbell. If you, did any of you ever encounter the, the ding dong doorbell? It goes ding when you push the button and dong when you let go. Ding dong. That's arranged with two bells and a, and a, and a piece of metal that gets sucked into the, into the field when you press the button and hits the first bell on its way and think it hits. And then when you release it, a spring returns, you release the button and turn off the current, a spring returns the flying piece of metal to where it started. It rebounds and hits the other bell. Dong. Picture that? It also, that same effect shows up in what are known as relays. Let me see. I left this up there the whole time, right? I've got to zoom in more. Zoom in. Oh, get yourself focused. This is an electromagnetic switch. That's a, that's a coil of wire there and a piece of iron near it. So the coil of wire, if, if current goes through it, will become magnetic and suck the iron toward it. And I can turn on the coil of wire. By current. Here's current off, current on, current off. Can you see that little, it's a subtle movement. Can you see that movement? That's opening and closing sw switches. And that sound, you hear the, hear the tic-tac sound? You've heard that around your house. Various devices in your house use these relay systems where a current opens and closes switches to turn on off, for example, your heater or your air conditioner or the, something in the microwave. Um, those are, so those are electrically controlled switches using magnet to suck a piece of iron alternately toward the electromagnet or release it. Right? And all, another thing, instead of pulling, instead of an electrically cold, controlled switch, an electrically controlled valve. How do you think your washer controls the flow of water? It has, these are called solenoids. That concept where you have a piece of iron and a coil of wire and the iron gets sucked into the coil when you run current through it, that's called a solenoid. And that is, it's in your car, it's part of the starting system, there's a solenoid in there to suck the gears, to, to punch the gears into place when you start your car. And in your, in your washer, when, when the iron gets sucked into the coil, opens a valve, a physical valve. So it's, like, it's like an electric, electrically controlled faucet. Water starts. You can hear them clicking. That, that's what those are, OK? Um, one more thing to show you, just because it's fun, too. This is a hand-powered generator. When you turn it, you will move Magnets in your coils of wire or coils of wire in your magnets, it's, it doesn't, doesn't matter which one you do. Moving magnets are electric and push current through a wire. So when I crank this guy, it's going to begin to, you, it will develop an electric field that pushes current through wires and makes current flow. Okay? This, which looks surprisingly like the first one, can be thought of as an electric motor. It's a device, when you run current through it, it becomes an electromagnet. And the electromagnets attract other magnets, then they, the forces, you know, motion occurs, and the, the current now is providing energy to these electromagnets and, and magnets that are, that are pulling toward each other and maybe pushing each other apart. The point is that generators and motors are often the same device. When I crank this guy, 
that guy starts moving around. This is the generator, that's the motor. But it's completely symmetric. Same device. And with that, I'll, I'll call it a day. And we'll, we'll go back to radio on Friday.